Hello and welcome. This is Randy with Excel for Freelancers and today in Employee Manager Part 5 we have a massive training for you today where we're going to cover our brand new events design screen where we got it reoccurring and reminders along with email reminders. We have a new admin screen where we're going to be creating employee status, position, event types. We'll be able to create automatically pay periods. We have also updated the show all open attachments. We have a new events tab where we're going to be going over that in the employee manager. We have also made updates to the employee list. We have added an employee archive to archive employees. So it's going to be an epic training. I can't wait to show you all the new features. Let's get started. All right, I'm excited to bring you this week's employee manager. We have so much to cover. In fact, so much I've made a list. So here's our list of the things we're going to try to get it all in. We'll probably go well over an hour in this training. So make sure you have your coffee, get ready, and uh, let's get started. We're going to cover the attachment open. That's something that we uh, did not cover with the attachment. So we want to make sure to cover that as well as delete. So when we delete the attachments, we have that macro assigned now and completed so we can show that to you. Event sheet. I created a brand new event sheet and it's in the design phases right now. It's not functioning yet. In fact, before I make it completely functioning, I want to get your ideas, your feedback, and your comments on this. We have so far an event name, uh, the event type where we have a list of types, and these lists originate from our new admin screen where we have different event types so we can add from there. We also have an employee and assign the ability to assign an employee, so that's going to help us. And we have a created on date, which will default to the current date and time when you create an event or when one is created automatically based on the recurring status. We have events notes. We have a really cool function, an ability to, to add checkboxes. Now I wanted to show you a different way to add checkboxes. In fact, this is a single cell, a single click on this is going to show you how to do that. And it's really cool. I, I know we have the ability to add checkboxes through both form controls and ActiveX. ActiveX has some issues with Mac. Form controls doesn't really look very beautiful. I don't really like the way the checkbox style is here. So I wanted to just try something different. Now checkbox would work just fine, of course, but you know, me being different, I want to try things differently and show you a different way to do things. It may be a little bit more complicated, but uh, it's very cool because you can use just one cell and it doesn't use any form controls. It doesn't use any active cells. So I'm excited to show that to you along with the conditional formatting that shows you this and the same thing for reminders. And of course, reminders, we have the ability to add emails. And so if we add emails, uh, we become active and we can add emails. This is not functioning yet as far as because I wanted to get your feedback and see what else we should add to this. So I'm looking forward to, we'll show you what we have done so far on this and, and what possibilities are. But right, if we have your feedback, it's going to be really helpful to complete this events. And employee events, of course, will be summarized in our brand new tab here. All the events associated with a specific employee will be displayed here using advanced filters. And we're going to show you how that works, of course, in the future as we build out this. Let's see what else we have we have the delete and archive I've changed this to archive employees now we do have the ability to delete employee but I think most likely we don't want to delete employees we want to archive them I want to remove them from this list but I still want to have them their information available in case we need it in the future so we created a brand new list called employee archive and any employee that gets archived will be located here in the future we can have a way we can have a button up here that says add back so let's say an employee leaves and then they come back i would love the ability to add this employee back to the main employee list here so i think we're going to add that in so something like a button up here that just says um, add back to employees or non-archive or something like that and that'll put their uh back inside the main list so that they're available in case the employee returns. So that's an important feature. I'm going to show you how we did that. Also we have, let's go ahead, employee named range. We have that in delete. So we're going to go with that. We also have the ability to search for employee just by typing in. So we have a new that just by typing in. I'm going to show you that feature. It's really cool. We 
did have that request to search. Now in this particular training, we have so much to cover that I am going to, I've already done the work, but we're gonna walk you step by step through what we did as opposed to me creating it. Now I know you all prefer me to do it live, but we have so much to cover. And you know, this is gonna be a 20 part series unless I do some of the work beforehand and walk you through steps. Of course, many applications I will create them live just for you to see but in this one this feature look at look at all these features it would take me 10 hours to show you to create these so I will walk you through step by step of what we did it'll save a little bit of time and it'll show you how to create lots of features we also have runtime macros I'm going to show you that that just basically speeds up our code so we'll show you that employee ID search I just went over that a group hide buttons on tab change we've grouped so in other words I've grouped these into a group uh, here so that we can hide those and uh, we also have the ability to add a payroll history and I've added payroll onto these so that we can show the from and to date both in the payroll history and the time clock history we generate payrolls and that's going to be great let's take a look at this I want to show you this feature we're going to delete these just for now and we have the ability to create pay periods in fact let me extend this shape that's uh, going to be a little bit wider there all right, pay periods. And so we have the ability to create pay periods, which is gonna be a really cool feature so that when we create pay periods, we can create them at any frequency. So let's say we have a weekly pay period and we wanna create 10 pay periods and we're gonna start it out on January 1st. We have that ability just to click the button. We can add, create a new list or add to the existing list. Creating pay periods is gonna automatically create pay periods based on that. So I'm really, really excited to show you that feature. And then once we do create those pay periods, they become available in this list right here. So we can easily create the from to and create advanced filters based on that it's really powerful really really powerful because it's flexible for whatever your type of pay period is we can create those in pay periods we're going to use those for creating payroll we're going to use those for creating time clock because the time clock history will also be based on those from and to dates so it's a really great feature we're going to get to that soon let's see what else we've got we've got so much to cover um, Employee status name range, these are all in the admin screen, which we created. Time clock history, we've gone over that. I just said add to archive, we've gone over that briefly. Hourly or salary option, that's kind of a cool thing. Let's take a look in the payroll detail. Earnings detail, now we have payroll type, we have salary and hourly. But if it's salary, there's a frequency here, right? So if we've entered salary, we have a specific frequency here that we may want to add in, and we have a salary amount here. But if it's hourly, this field shouldn't exist, right? So when we change this to hourly, I want to use conditional formatting to clear that, and I also want to change this label based on this. So we're going to show you that real quickly. and we'll get to all of that I believe that is it let's take a look at that and the event screen design so we're gonna cover that let's get started we've gone through the summary of everything we're gonna cover let's start off with the attach open that is the first macro and sheet that I'm gonna show you so let's do that now we can add the ability to add an attachment of course we went over that and we went over that and we'll go ahead and let me update this that's too big so let's take a look at what that is and we've also added the ability oh, I forgot this we had so much let's take a look I've also added the ability to preview uh, f larger files like PDFs let's take a look at that we'll find a PDF that we can show you we have the ability to preview that let's take a look at that PDF and we have the ability to preview PDFs which is going to be a really cool feature on a larger scale and you see here now we have the ability to preview a PDF just by selecting it so we have that. I've also got that for a Word document too. I almost forgot about that. So we've got that. And then the pictures, of course. Let's go ahead and set the size for those pictures. That's too big from testing. Into the Developers tab we go. Visual Basic. All right, into the Employee Attachments. Here we have Display Thumbnail. Let's go ahead and set that to 90. So that'll be a less of a width and a little bit less of the height. And now when we take a look at that, there we go. Now it's set up. All right, so now we're also gonna show you the preview. We also have the ability to do that with a Word document too. Let's go ahead and see if we can find a Word document. 
And uh, okay, we've got that one here. And we have the ability to preview a Word document, and that'll position itself over on the right. So we've got previews for Word documents, we've got previews for PDF documents, and we've got previews for pictures now. Now I left off Excel. Excel was a little bit slow. You can try it, and we'll go over that code. But I found that a little bit slow and, and not really workable very well. So we kind of left that off as far as previewing Excel files. But PDF and Word, the most two most common, we have those available. So I'm going to show you that as well. So let's get started. On the attachment open, let's go ahead and go into the VBA. And basically what that does is it lets us click on a and click on any line item and click open and it's going to open the individual picture in a larger file as you can see here and that would work for any type of file even a PDF so if we were to select on a PDF and then click open it'll actually open that PDF so we can see that here in a, in a little bit larger form they'll reduce that so it's going to open that and we do that through a macro and once again right click assign macro and I've already assigned this macro to a macro called attach open so let's locate that macro and see how that works it's very very simple so into the employee attachments here and if we scroll down we see something called attach open so let's focus on this macro with sheet one of course we're working on sheet one that's the only one we want to make sure that we actually have a value in b7 that is the row that is the attachment row that we've selected let's go ahead and review that every time we select a specific attachment we are going to be able to put that row through vba code in b7 here b7 changes and of course if we select outside of it it disappears so when we select it b7 equals 21 that is the row that we select so we need to know that row because we need to pull the file path from column g so we need to know that row g and the row will give us that file path in order to open that document or that file we need to know to make sure that we do have that row so that's important so if it's empty if b7 is empty then it says please select an attachment to open for example if we try to click here and b7 is empty and then we click open attachment we're going to get that message please select an attachment why because b7 is empty so that's how that works moving on if now we have the attachment row we can assign that to b7 so it's very simple it's pretty much single line of code g remember column g that's where our file is located our, our file path is located and the attachment row that value that is our full path all we're going to do is follow the hyperlink and that'll open the document regardless of the type of document whether it's picture word file excel or whatever it will open that up so it's a very very simple code we just need to make sure that there's a value in b7 so we can pull that row and we've assigned that all right moving on to attachments delete we did not cover that last time so let's go ahead and cover that again we're going to define two different variables and employee ID and the attachment row so we need that employee ID may not be important at this point but the attachment row is. So first of all, we want to make sure that the active cell row is not empty, that J, J is the, why is J? J is the attachment row that we assigned. We need to have that here. That has been assigned, right? It is here now before it was a different. So J is very important. We need that. This is our attachment row. You may want to hide these. Remember, once you have this set, if you're going to be distributing these, you don't want these numbers to show up. Simply just change the font color to the same as the background color here, and of course it will disappear. But we need those. Those are the rows in the attachments file. For example, 12. If we look at the attachments, we see row 12. This is the profile JPG. This is it. This is the file. So if we're going to delete this row, we need to know the row number and that row number is stored here in J and the active cell column active cell is the one you've selected so that's important we need to get that 12 so we know what row to delete all right back into the code so for example if J in the active cell is empty you're just gonna say please select an attachment to delete first if it's empty so we need that next up we've got an on-air resume just in case there is no uh, attachment thumbnail to delete okay we'll want to delete any thumbnail that's displayed because we're going to delete the file we don't need to show the thumbnail as well so we've deleted that and then we're going to set the attachment row to sheet 1j 
and the active cell row. We could just as well as use B7 here as well because that's, so it's just a different way to display it, but B7 also includes that same row. However, we're just showing you a different way to do that, as I like to show you multiple ways to do the same thing so that you can choose which method is best for your project. Next up, all we need to do now is delete the actual row in sheet three, that is our attachments, that is our attachment sheet here, sheet three. And I always like to use sheet three because we don't want to use the name of the sheet because that might change, you just could change names, so we don't have to change the code if we stick with the sheet number. And the attachment row and quotation marks colon and quotation marks and the attachment row entire row delete. Next up, we're going to run the attach refresh macro, and that removes, that's going to run that advanced filter and remove that actual line item from the attachment list. And next up, we'll select E19 to select and display whatever thumbnail is in that if there is any. For example, if we were to delete this document here, we'll go ahead and select on that. And then we'll go ahead and click delete. Once again, right click assign macro this is the macro attach delete this is the one we just went over that is assigned to that button and icon so when we select a specific line item we click attachment delete it's automatically deleted and then of course the e19 is selected here which displays whatever we have selected in this case it's a pdf so it'll, I've displayed it here. You know, I didn't want to display a small thumbnail. It was almost, especially for something as big as like that, because if you look at it, if we reduce that size down to just a thumbnail, it's going to be pretty ugly and almost useless, right? Because if it's a big, right, that's almost useless. So I decided to, to make it big for, for PDFs and Word and then, and then bring them here so you could actually see what's in it. Now this functionality we did go over in our file manager. If you remember that, we did go do a file preview. So if you want to learn more about how to preview these files, we did go over that in our file manager series. So you can check that out on YouTube. So that's a great field. So where we actually were able to preview file larger files like PDF, Word, Excel, and of course pictures, videos, and of course uh, sound type of AVI, so we covered that as well in the file manager. All right, let's dive down into the macro that creates these previews for both the PDF and Word documents, and we'll take a look and to see how we did that. So into the VBA, under the module employee attachment, we have the attached display thumbnail. Now we have this before and we had the picture file, but now we're gonna focus on additional, some code that we had additional. Now you'll see here, if we have the file type, and the file type is defined here for F in the attachment row, that's going to get us our file type back in the file. You'll see our file type, we'll scroll on over to the left a little bit, and you'll see our file type is located in F. So we're focused on this file type. So we've defined that into the file type variable here. And so once we set the file type, we can determine if it's JPG, PNG, GIF, JPEG or BMP, those are the picture type, and we can set this picture types. We can then go ahead and do the following, which sets it as a picture and puts it in a specific position uh, on J19, and then of course the specific size, either 90 maximum on the width or 80 maximum on the height. And then uh, increment left, move it over a little bit to the right and just a little bit down. However, else if, we're using the else if, file type is docx document or pdf or doc then do the following and of course on air resume next just in case there's an issue with this and basically what we're going to do is we're going to create an object an ole object and we're going to add on that and it's going to be based on the file path and of course we've defined the file path here in g which is a file path of the attachment we're gonna we're not gonna link it and we're gonna we're not gonna display as an icon is false we don't want it and we're gonna give it a name and this name is gonna be the same exact name that we would give it as a picture the reason we give it the same name is so that we can delete it or hide it um, and we would be hiding either the picture or the thumbnail attachment or excuse me the PDF or word attachment thumbnail larger thumbnail picture so we can hide it using the same name because both of these aren't going to exist at the same time. It's going to be either this or this. So we can assign the same name and then we can delete it also using the same name. 
And then of course with the shapes, now it's the shapes and we've attached the thumbnail just as we did here, except we were going to place it in a different position. As you know, our attachments, of course, for PDF and Word documents can be over to the right and they're going to be larger. So we're going to be basing that off, I believe, O04, which is the anchored cell, and then we're going to place it over there. So we're going to use this, excuse me, L4. We're going to use L4 as the anchored uh, cell, and then we're going to place it uh, over that. So we're going to set L4 as that anchor, right? That's where it's going to be located. And then we're going to move it a little bit over to the right. Once again, we're going to display the height uh, and the width based on, so we're going to say if the width is greater than the height, then the width is 300. Otherwise, the height is 500. And basically what this does is it sets maximums. It sets the maximum height of 500 and the maximum width of 300. And it keeps that aspect ratio. We want to lock that aspect ratio so that we don't get some funny types of aspect ratio so that, that we cannot read. We want the aspect ratio to remain. That's very important. So all we're going to be doing is setting it based on L4, setting that picture. Okay, It's now a picture or a shape. And then we're going to set the width. And then we're going to move it a little bit over to the right from L, from L4, and a little bit below the top of L4. So that is it. That's all we have to do. Now, if you wanted to try Excel, you can just do something like or um, file type equals um, XL. It will work, but not very good. Depends on the type of file, XLSX or XLSM. You can do that and try it and see how it works. I, I had some issues. It was very slow to open and um, it just wasn't great, right? It kind of works, but not not great. So I kind of left it out, but you can try it, you know? And if you're opening simple, very simple, basic Excel files, it probably would work okay. If you're opening up um, files that involve macros or larger, it probably would be too slow. So it's kind of something you can try to see. But with uh, Word documents and PDF, it works pretty well. So for that, that's fine. All right, great. I'm glad we got that covered. Let's get back into the application now and go on from there. So moving along, we have that. Now we've covered delete. We've covered open. So we've got those two things. And let's cover the event sheet. Let's go ahead and go over so we can do this systematically. What we have covered, we'll change the font on that so we can go over event sheet. All right, we've got that. I've got both of them here, the sheet and the design. Let's go ahead and go over the events part in this payroll manager here. We've added a new tab and you'll see everything has been switched over and everything's been redesigned based on this new tab. So I've extended fields here to make more room and I've completely redesigned it. And I've also updated the mapping. Now when you update it, I've updated this mapping for the proper columns in our attachments in our employee list sheet here so all the mapping has been updated accordingly and we have added in a few small things but everything's been updated so this mapping has also been updated and please make sure if you want to add columns add rows this mapping here must coincide f8 for example in the address must coincide with the main sheet here, for example, F8 address F8 must coincide always with this here, F8. So make sure everything, as well as mapping, if you're going to be adding columns or adding rows, this must, so F8, for example, F8 in the employee list, well, that is column five, right? Five, one, two, three, four, five is the address. So we want to make sure that when we make any changes, all the way over here is also equal to column five. Okay, so that's very important. When you make changes, you want to update them. These buttons are not, let's remove these. These are not necessary. This is only for mapping purposes. So we don't need that. Okay, so we just remove that. All right, so moving on, we've covered uh, up mapping. And so now I've updated, I've added a brand new tab events. This is not functional yet, but basically the idea is that uh, all the events for that specific employee are going to be located here, or perhaps not all of them, but at least uh, 17 of them. And then, of course, we'll put a show all button here so that when we show all the events, it's going to automatically go over to the events and then show all the events. We'll put in a filter here for that employee name 
and then we'll go ahead and down. Maybe we'll add an employee ID here. I don't love, the employee name is nice, but remember, I, employee names tend to change. Employee IDs will not. So I've added a column for employee IDs here. So we'll do a lot of filtering by employee ID because employee IDs don't change. But it's, you know, when you want it, most times you don't know the employee ID or you haven't memorized it. So it's nice to have the ability to filter by employee name. So we want kind of both. And uh, all right, back into the employee manager. So let's go over the update. So I've extended that. I've extended this. In the time clock history, I've added notes field. Now we have some extra field. So we've added the ability to have notes. I've also added, let's see, start time, end time, total break, regular hours, overtime. That hasn't changed. Now I've added this. We're going to go over the ability to automatically add from and to dates based on the user selection. I also want to put a pop-up calendar here so the user can put in custom dates. I want to do the same thing for time clock and payroll history. These are going to be the same, right? I've also added notes here under the payroll history. So that's going to be really better. So that additional tab really helped us out because we needed a little bit more space on many of the screens. So it kind of helped us out adding that events tab worked well. It was a good amount of work. So that's why I did it beforehand because it would be a little bit slow if I'm doing it while it but uh, basically you understand the methodology I went through based on the first one. So all I did was add additional conditional formatting and updated the code for that. Scheduling, of course, I've also added a, st a break start and a break end. So we've expanded that. We have start time and end time. And now we can add the break before we just had total break. Break. Now we can add break times, which is really going to be helpful to adding that ability so we can drill down a little bit closer into the um, breaks and detail for workday. So that's nice. Leave, we've also added some additional leave. I've added the ability to accrue annual leave annually. Sometimes we, like we want to carry over a, a personal time off PTO for every year. Sometimes we want to clear it out. So example, if an employee has not used their time off in a full year, what do we do? Do we carry it over to the next year or do we clear it out? So that's a really important option. So we're going to put a yes or no or true or false right here, an option so that, so that we know whether to accrue it annually or clear it out annually. So that's really important when we're running employees. We need to know that so that that'll be helpful and uh, so we've added total accrued total hours and hours remaining here so we've expanded we've been able to expand on this by adding that extra events tab we've been able to expand on this as well because that's really important a lot of you have made requests and the events tab we're going to build this out we just went over that all right so we've added the ability to archive employees uh, I went over the events let's just change this events changes all right, and the events tab we went over, so we went over both of those. We'll cover that. I want to make sure that we cover everything as we needed to. Now, delete or archive employee. Let's move on to that. I've added the ability to simply archive an employee. So if we select an employee and we want to archive it, we're going to click on that, and it's going to say, are you sure you want to archive this employee? Their name will no longer be available in the drop-down list. That's what we want. We don't want our Magos Selena to appear in this list anymore. So when we click yes, it's going, to, uh, it's going to say they've been archived, and then their name is no longer in this list, which is what we want, because we only want, and yet their information is still going to be available here. Now we've added it to the list. Let's show you, and their status is automatically changed to inactive. Their status has changed to inactive, and they've been brought to there, so they're no longer in the playlist. Let's go over the macro that does that so we can see how that's done. Now, theoretically, if you add an employee and you want to remove them, yes, of course, you can delete an admin. Perhaps an admin can delete it from here so that there's zero history, but I don't recommend that unless, of course, you add an employee by mistake or something. And then So you do have the ability, but most likely you don't want to remove employees' information 100%. You want some record of them. So we have that ability with the employee archive. Let's go ahead and see just how we did that. Into the VBA we go and we have employee miscellaneous and now we, if we scroll down here we have a macro called employee archive. Employee archive and this macro has been assigned to that button. We're going to dimension the employee row as long and the employee archive row as long and the employee name is a string so we have all those dimensions. Just as you saw we've created a message box. Are you sure you want to uh, 
archive this employee and then VBCL this creates a new line in the message box so this is the line below at VBCRLF and so that gives us the new line their name will no longer be available and it says it's a VB yes or no so the buttons are yes or no and then we give the title of this little pop-up called archive employee yes or no then exit if it equals no then we're going to exit the sub so we can achieve all that with just one line of code moving on assuming they have not set no we can then continue with our archive of that employee with sheet one we'll primarily focus on that we want to make sure before if it's empty if that is empty that is our employee row we cannot delete an employee if we don't have the row in before Right, so that is our B4 is our employee. I, based on their ID, it's the row. We'll need to know what row to delete in this list and what row to copy over to the employee list. So the row is critical. If we don't have that row, then of course we need to alert the user that we do need the row. So in this instance, we can do that. If B4 equals empty, then we're going to say message box, please select employee to archive. Exit the sub after that because we do not want that uh, to continue. Next up, assuming that we do have a value in B4, we can then assign the employee name based on the F2 value, that is the employee row, and of course the employee row in B4, so we've assigned both of those. The archive row, now of course we're going to be adding it to the archive, and what we want to do is we want to find the next available row, which is simply going to be using column A, using X and L up, we can assign, determine the next row. In this case, it would be six. So we need to know the employee to archive and where to put it, which would be in the first available row. So we can do that with sheet six, A, 999, X, L, up, row, plus one is the first available archive row. So we've set that up. Now we've got the first available row. We also want to set this employee to an active. H14 is our employee status. We want to set it to inactive. What that's going to do is automatically create uh, that inactive. Now you can assign this to any status you want. Remember, you can set this. But I do recommend whatever you assign here, whatever you add in the code here, make sure that you have that option available in here. So I've colored this blue, but remember, just make sure it's actually an employee status. That's best to, you don't want to create any issues. So make sure, like, let's say you want to say, call it terminated, right? You can create a terminated, and then you can also add that in the code. Just make sure that it's the same. So that's going to be helpful. We want to make sure we're assigning an actual employee status. Whatever status we, we have here, so if we create uh, status here, it's going to then be available as an option in our status here automatically using uh, offset so we've that will be helpful there so we want to make sure h14 is that is where we assign the inactive status before we delete the employee and we move it over so moving on in the code we assign it inactive. you can change this to whatever you want next up sheet 6a and the archive row and ac ac is the last column equals right we want to move that sheet 2 in the employee row to AC in the employee row equals the employee row. So all we're doing is copying over data. With this one line of code, all we're doing is copying. So we're going to determine what we're saying here. Let's go back into the sheet. A all the way to AC equals employee list, whatever the employee list, A and AC here equals that. So it's a straight equals to equals same columns we're just basically copying it's like another way to copy over except we're using a a quicker value to value as opposed to copy and paste value so it's a little bit quicker that way so that's all we're doing before we remove this employee row i want to make sure it's added to the employee archive here okay so next up we have that now that we've known now we can take that sheet to employee list and remove it so the employee row and quotation marks colon quotation marks and employee row entire row delete so now it's been deleted now what we want to do is i want to remove now that we've deleted that employee off of the employee active there what i want to do is i want to clear this screen as well and we can do that with the next line of code because i don't want to have employees here that are no longer there so we can do that saying uh sheet one f2 value equals sheet two bc4 value bc4 is the first available 
Wow, if you remember in one of our previous trainings, let's take a look at that. BC4 is our first available right here, BC4. BC4 is the first available employee based on the employee names right there. So we're going to equal that right there. And so that will put that value right here to the employee. So that'll put our first employee just to default to the first employee that we have in the list so that we no longer can clear out whatever the deleted employee there is or the archived employee, I should say. All right, so that's how we get it. And then we get a message box saying employee name, whatever employee name that was stored in this has been archived. So that let's go ahead and just go over and see what that looks like again. If we select, let's say, Audi Una, okay, and we click archive, it's going to say, are you sure you want to archive this employee? The next line, their name will no longer be available in the drop-down list. Yes, and then it says, uh, Audi Una has been archived. And so, it's no longer in this list. As you can see, it's no longer in this list. It's also no longer in the employee list here. If we move back, we see it's no longer here. And of course, it's been added to the archive here. So we have that now under the next line. So that's really, really handy. And I thought you would like to show that. A lot of you had requested that. So I wanted to make sure to get that in. All right, now we've covered employee uh, delete and archive the employee. So we can clear that out as covered. Next up, employee named range delete. This is an important issue. When we delete, when we actually delete an employee, if we delete it from the name range, it's going to cause issues. So for example, if we delete the first available and we have a named range that uses this row, it could create a ref error. A lot of you have that, a ref error if we were to delete this. In order to get around it, what we must do is include this row, row three, in the employee named range. Let's go over that. In the formula, name manager, and we see employee ID and we tab over. Now, as always, it's going to start at four, right, and go all the way to the end, right? However, what we did is we've customized this here, right here by including A3, including the header rows here, except we're offsetting the row by one in this case. Normally we don't, but if we offset the row, it's going to start one row below. And then when we count, we also want to include A3, we want to count, but we're counting and then we're going to subtract one from the count. And what this does is it allows us to delete row four without creating a reference error. Reference error, so that's really important. So we want to be able to do that. Otherwise, if we delete row four, which is the first row theoretically, it could create a ref error. So by including row three in both of these, we remove that possibility to have that error because row three will never be deleted. It is our header row. So that's why we do that. And we've done the same thing for employee name as well. Employee name also includes row three. So that's really important. So I wanted to show that to you. And that helps us avoid ref errors when we use, uh, when we delete sometimes the first row of a named range. So that was important. I wanted to show that to you. I'm glad I got that covered because a few of you had that issue. So I wanted to show you a way around that error. All right. So now we've got group hydrobots on tab change. Now we had some issues where we have a group here and so I want to show you a way we can group that. Let's go ahead and look at that. Sometimes when we change, we, wa we want to hide that group. So let's show you how we can do that. Back into the developers, when we change modes, let's go into our employee tabs here. We have horizontal tabs. And let's create a group called general info group. This will create it a general info group and this will allow us to hide that general info group when we when the tab is not five tab is the first so let's do that and so we can show you how I want to hold this down I want to, all these buttons and I also want to create a, this one I want to create this and these as a part of a group and I'm going to group those like this and we'll call it general info group now when we switch tabs 
that is automatically hidden and some screens it's going to show up and so that's really going to help so when it's hidden so that general info group will hide all of the important buttons when we're not on general info because a lot of times it will show up in, on other tabs so that's helpful so I wanted to show you that simply by creating the group now the picture is I did not include the picture because that is separate in fact this picture we might want to resize that and move it over it's not in the center let's put it in the center we can use that under positioning so back into the tabs and employ picture max and when we want to display right employee picture show employee picture we're going to increment left let's move that over a little bit maybe to 40 and we'll see how that looks and uh, go back and then display it oh, that's a little bit better and maybe we can make it a little bit bigger here let's also send I want to also take this and bring this square so that both the height and the width are the same and actually what I need to do is I need to when you see this automatically it changes we'll click on the size we don't want to lock the aspect aspect ratio so we want to set them both as 17 so by unclicking the lock aspect ratio it's gonna allow us to do that alright so now we've got that and we can make it a little bit bigger now that we have some more space in our screen so we can do it we can increase the height simply by pulling it over here under the display and we can create the height a little bit maybe 100 let's take a look at that and see how that so we can make adjustments very very simply here now that we have a little bit more space and simply by going to another tab and then going back into general that's almost a little bit too big so perhaps 95 all right so we're good with that we got those set we can make those fine tunes more a little bit later on and let's let's go up employee ID search this is a great suggestion that I had and I want to show you the ability you may know the employee ID and you may want to just add it right here one zero zero seven all right so that easily adds it let's show you how we did that I've colored this white so that users know they can enter it I've added a little search icon here just to the it directs users to know how they can search it and what I want to do is that basically when a user makes a change to this I want to search for it and if it's not found I want to I want to let them know that was way too quick I mean we got to slow that down it says employee ID not found but it was a little too quick right so we have a fade out message let's go ahead and show you how we did that back into the visual basic and that is going to be the first off we're going to focus on some changes that is going to be the worksheet change, right? Because the user's actually making a change to the worksheet. And if we drill down here, take a look at employee ID, we can see that we're going to make some changes. So J2 is the employee ID cell. That is the cell. And now remember, we want to differentiate. There's two ways to make a change here. When we select, right? When we select employee, there's a change right here, right? Let's take a look at that. There's a change, right? but there's a difference I want to make a difference I want to tell the software if the application is loading an employee this is going to change but don't search right I want that macro to run I only want to search for an employee when a user actually makes a physical change to this right so we have to differentiate between those two changes that's very important one change is when the when the application loads when the application loads an employee there's a change but I don't want to do a search when that kind of change I only want to do a search when the user types in a change All right so only that search that is the only type of search that I want to look for so we need to differentiate now if you remember perhaps when we load an employee when we load an employee this goes to true right if you look let's see if it's how let's see it's very fast you'll see very very fast this goes to true look at keep your eye on b1 it goes goes to true very fast so when this is true when this becomes true don't do not perform a search okay when the employees loading do not perform a search so we can make that change right in here it says if there is a change to j2 and b1 equals false b1 must equal false why is that because when we load an employee let's take a look at employee load here and when we load employee we set b1 to true and at the end we set it back to false so when those changes are made do not do not perform a search so that's why we have that so 
B1 is false, it says on change of employee date, but not on employee load. So that's how we differentiate between those two types of changes. All right, next up, if J2 value does not equal empty and B4 does not equal empty, then it's found. Employee ID is found, right? We want to make sure J2, that is the employee ID, and B4, B4, which is our row, employee ID row using our index match, our match formula, will tell us the row. So we need to know that row. That means if there's, as long as there's an employee ID there in B4, we know that there's a row. B4 is here, and it tells us what the employee ID row, and that's based on the match formula, which we went over previously. So we have the row, we can load it in, right? So that's based on the employee ID here and J2 value using match plus three. That's going to get us our actual row in the employee list. So we need that to move forward with this type of... So F2 value equals... equals what is F2? F2 is the employee name. It equals sheet two, which is our employee list. BC, remember, these are employee names based on the formula BC. And the B4 value, B4 is the employee row, sheet two. So we're, this basically places that name, it places that name right here. And when we place a name here, automatically it loads, right? If we place, if we add a name of Brad Carley, as soon, as soon as we change it, it's going to load, right? It's going to load here. Let's, all right, so that's really important. So I wanted to show you that. Or, Right, it's going to load that name, so all we have to do is take the name, place it here, and the macro will automatically run as soon as we change the name. So that's all we have to do. It's very simple. All we have to do is take the name, BC, and the B4 value. Let's look at that. Employee list, BC, right, BC is all of our names, and whatever row it is, let's say row 12, it's going to be it. So if we want to load... Barrett Freda, right? We know that it's 1010 as the employee ID. So when we put in 1010, it's going to automatically load that very, very simply, very, very easily, and not with a lot of code. So that's all we're doing. Now, else, else, what does that mean, else? That means if J2E does equal empty or if B4 is empty, that means it's a wrong employee ID, right? Wrong employee ID. If there's an error, it's going to be blank, right? If there's an error here, it's going to be blank. That means the employee ID is not found. So if we enter an incorrect employee ID like this, it's going to say employee ID, but that pop-up message is way too fast. Let's slow that down so you can see it. And uh, let's move back into the code. And so we can see employee ID not found. We're going to run the fade out message alert here. And let's take a look at that. We've gone over fade out messages, but they're really, really good. We can set this to double. Let's see, delay timer four. Let's see if that's a little bit slower. We can put a larger delay on that so we can see that. And now we'll enter employee. All right, that's a little bit faster there. So you can see, you can slow it up. Employee ID not found it, but it's not big enough, right? We need to stretch that out. Let's go into the shapes and we'll go to ID not found, so we're going to select that shape and we'll make it a little bit bigger too because we need it. Employee ID not found. There we go. Now we can see it and uh, that's better. So now when we put the employee ID not found, and it's still a little bit fast, but uh, you can adjust the times. All you need to do is just change this number here and then it'll be a little bit slower. We'll increase that delay so it helps. We have gone over fade out messages before. There's a specific video in YouTube that covers that. So if you want to look at, just click fade out messages Excel or search that in YouTube and you'll find that and I go over everything. So now we've got a little bit slower. There we go. Now we can read it so it tells us employee ID is not found very, very simply. And we do that just by running this macro on else. So when we go back into employee manager, we're going to set F2. We need to set it F2. And the B5 value, what is the B5 value? What I want to do is I want to set it back to the name it was. B5 is the employee row based on the number. That's why we have two employee rows, right? We, excuse me, based on the name, right? We have employee row based on the ID, right? But if it's incorrect, we need to go back to the one that's with using the name. This row is based, even though they're the same row, because as soon as we... Let's stop the code. Let's just go ahead and show. I'm going to pause the code, right? And uh, as soon as we change this, right, 
Okay, now we have, we've made a change, and look, because there's no employee, this is blank, right? This is blank, because there's an error here. So what we said, okay, but the name is still good. It's the old name, right? We haven't loaded it. it says, okay, if there's an incorrect ID, then take the row based on the employee name and reload it. So all we're going to do is take this. So all we're going to say is, okay, we know that the row is based on the name here, employee list under 12 here. BC, it's going to say, take whatever is here, take whatever is here, BC and 12, and paste it or copy it right into here. And all that does is reload it. So let's go ahead and reset the code now. And let's go back into that. So all it's going to do is take this and enter it. And it, just like that, it's going to enter it just like that. So that's all we have to do. It refreshes it and then it goes back to, it reloads the employee and that reloads their specific ID in place. So, so that's how we, in case there's an issue, it automatically loads the old employee just like that. So it's really, really convenient, really, really helpful. And uh, it's a great way to search employee. Now we have the ability to search employees by name or by ID. So covered that. All right, let's go ahead and color that. We've got a lot to cover. We're already quite a bit into this video, 40, about 50 minutes, 48 minutes. So we're going to continue down our list. I've also added runtime macros to this project almost with every single project I do and that's really important for speed. Let's go ahead and go over that and it's very very uh, simple here and all that is is the ability to stop the calculations which uh, puts them to manual and screen updating to false and then of course resetting calculations uh, also bringing them back to automatic and updating and the reason I do this is I use this it gets a little bit slow, especially when loading employees. So for example, when we have uh, employee load here, you will see that I, uh, I've stopped the calculations running that macro. And of course, before the macro ends, without this, it's gonna be a lot slower. Let's go ahead and you, you saw, uh, let's take a look. When I uh, load this macro, and run and load this employee just by hitting tab, it's gonna load pretty quick. But if I take that off, if I turn off calculations, let me go ahead and comment this out, and I'm gonna comment this out, and then do this, we're gonna perform the same actions right here. It's gonna be a lot of it slow, a little bit slower, you see that? And as we add more data, it's gonna become slower and slower unless we turn off those calculations and screen updating. So adding that is an important part of this application, as with most applications, and you'll wanna do the same. So when you see reset out case, uh, reset calculations and stop calculation macro, you'll understand what that is. So we've just added that and you'll see that through various types of uh, macros around just to speed things up. When you see that, you'll understand what that is all about. Okay, let's take a look. Pay type and pay pay type and fields. Let's go over that right now so we can see what those are. All right, pay types and fields are located here. We've had made it some changes and I notated this. I wanted to go over those into the payroll detail. We had pay type here. Now when we select hourly, this disappears using conditional formatting and this changes. However, salary, this changes here and then this becomes visible. So let's see how we did that. Now if you take a look here in this label, all we're doing is taking G66, which is the whatever the value they've selected, and then clicking amount. This allows us to create a dynamic label based on what the user has selected, whether it's a salary or hourly. So it's very simple. Creating that dynamic label helps the user to understand what they're entering here. Now we've added conditional formatting here, and basically let's take a look at that under the conditional formatting and then manage rules, we're gonna see what I have taken. And there's one specific rule, when we edit the rule, we'll see if G66 is hourly, when that happens, I wanna hide this field. I don't want it to show because there's nothing there. So I don't, well, this is based on the salary frequency. We don't need salary frequency when we have an hourly type of 
pay. So we can hide that simply by changing the formats. And there's three different format changes. We've cleared the borders by clicking clear, so there's going to be no borders that are displayed. We've taken the font and we've colored the font the same as the background color. And lastly, we've also assigned the fill color, complete fill color, so that the field is no longer white. And we've filled that with also the same blue as the background. So those three changes allows us to basically hide our salary type when we have selected hourly, so salary frequency. So eventually we're going to put in a drop down list that shows the frequency of the salary here so that you can put in the salary amount so if their pay is monthly. And I'm going to, we're going to add in some additional features and put in a frequency here, a drop down list over time. And we'll get to that hopefully next week or the week after. So then we can put in the salary amount over time. So I wanted to go over that with you to show you how we've developed that. All right. Next up, we've covered that. Let's go ahead and color that so we can keep track of what we colored. Employee status and named range, employee position named range, and employee types and named range. These three are actually four are all on the new admin screen. So let's look at that. In the admin screen, I've added a little bit of an icon here so we can determine what screen we're looking at quickly and easily. And we've added some dynamic named ranges for status, position, and event types. Let's look at those in the formulas name manager and we can see here under employee status and if we tab over that we're using an offset here starting on D5 and then we're counting all of those with text based on at based on the D5 through D21 so we're going to count them all using that and then we're going to clear that we're going that'll help us determine just those so we can drop down list only contains those values that the user has entered and the reason we don't have we're not using the header row as I explained earlier because these rows are not deleted sure that they're cleared out but the rows themselves are not deleted so we don't need to use the headers as part of our named range in this particular case and basically it's the same thing for event type we've also created a dynamic named range for event types so that as we add event types they get added and the same thing for employee position here all of those are dynamic named range in the setup so as we add those they become available in the other screens all right next up i want to create the pay periods i want users to create pay periods and i want them to either be able to add new pay periods or add on so for example if our last pay period is 318 and we want to create a new pay period starting at 319 we can do that simply by clicking on the pay period and you'll see i'm using a form pop-up i almost never use forms but in this case it applies so we can do that so let's say we want a start date of 319 so we have changed the date here and we want to create 10 more and then we select this option here add to existing list we want to add to the existing list i don't want to erase those we want to create 10 more and we can just click create pay periods and that's going to start off and automatically create those so and then we've created a dynamic named range based on those pay periods here in the formula in the name manager and if we look down here under pay period again another offset and count a using that so that it, this will expand automatically and this named range we're using in our application very frequently so we want to be able to create dynamic pay periods based on the frequency and I want to show you how we did that as well now as you know we've created three different there's really three or four different formulas that we're going to, we have a weekly we have a bi-weekly we have a semi-monthly we have a monthly so those these four different frequencies each have different formulas and what I can do is we can use a formula to determine what the start and end date is we know the start date but what is the end date right we need to know what that formula is but example this formula k5 plus 6 well that's easy for weekly but but it's going to be different if it's bi-weekly meaning every other week or if it's going to be semi-monthly semi-monthly would be twice a month right twice a month and every other week those are different formulas and if we also have a monthly we're going to need a different formula so based on whatever the user selects if they for example if they select bi-weekly and we want to create a new list so we're going to clear out the existing list if they select bi-weekly and we'll start it on January 1st just to make it easier and clear we can then create a bi-weekly pay period list 
based on that bi-weekly formula. So when we create the pay periods, that's going to create 10 pay periods based on this. And bi-weekly, so it's going to end on the 14th. So it's going to be a really great feature. I'm very excited to show that to you. All right, so let's see how we did that. Now, there's four different formulas based on the frequency, and we put those formulas in here. In fact, there's a formula here and a formula here, right? This is the first date they entered. So then I can add a formula here and a formula here. For example, this formula, we've selected bi-weekly, bi-weekly every two weeks. So the formula is pretty simple. It's this plus 13, and of course, this equals K5 plus 14, right? So it's 14. Now we have different. So I've basically taken the formulas, and the, the problem is we can't have formulas because this could get deleted, right? And so what we're doing is we've placed the formulas here, and the value is just fine. We don't need, in other words, the value error here is just fine because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this formula, I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste it right here. I'm going to take this formula, and I'm going to copy it and paste it right here. If it's weekly, if it's bi-weekly, I'm going to take this formula. For example, let's just show you one one. Okay, so now if I take this formula bi-weekly and I copy it and I paste that formula right here, we're going to have it right. We'll have the proper end date. Now if I take this formula, right click, copy, and I paste it right here, formula, we will have it properly. So that's all I'm doing. I'm taking the formulas and and based on the user selection, I'm pasting the whatever formula and I'm pasting it right in here. So that's really, really great. And the same thing, we'll just continue. Right click, copy, and pasting it here. Paste the formula. So that's all we need to do to continue this. So all we need to do is figure out one, which option did the user select? And then if the user selected weekly, which is on row 15, use this formula. If the user selected bi-weekly, use this formula. If the user selected semi-monthly, use this formula. And then monthly formula. Now the semi-monthly formula, that is a formula. Basically what this formula does is it's going to say A19. And the reason is there's, you know, A19 is nothing. But when it gets copied over, it becomes K19. You see that? K, so it becomes this. So the formula moves over based on that. So it's okay that it's it's an error here because once the once it gets moved over, it's no longer an error. So it gets copied over properly. So we can do that through VBA and copy those formula over. And this particular formula, basically it's going to say the day, if it's less than 15, then we want to show the year, whatever year, whatever month, and then the 15th day. Otherwise, if it's the end of the month, if the if it's the end of the month, right? A19 is the end of the month, then show the year, the month plus 1. We need to create, you know, the month the next month and then the 15th, right? So so if it's the end of the month, then show in that case at increase the month one more, just once more. Otherwise, the end of the month is just going to be the, the end of the month. Is We're just going to show the end of the month, whatever the last day of the month is, and the current month, so we don't know. So that's going to show it. Otherwise, so basically it's going to show the 15th or the end of the month. That's all we want on those. And in the monthly form, it's a little bit even simpler. This is going to be the year of A21, right? This is going to be, now remember, A21 is nothing, but as soon as we move it over, it's going to be K5 or K6 or whatever that. So you get the idea. And it's going to be the, the month, the year, plus one. We're going to increase the month once, and then the day, and then, of course, minus one. We're going to increase because we want the last day of the month for this one, and then we want the first day of the month with this one. So that's so we've created individual formulas, weekly, biweekly, semi-monthly means uh, twice a month, and then monthly formulas. So we have four different pay frequencies. And let's go into the VBA code and see how we did it. It's actually quite simple. It's not a lot of code because it's been set up. Let's go into that. And into the admin macros, we will see a create pay periods here. Create pay periods. And that is the macro that's going to run. We, got, we have a few dimensions. Uh, we've got payroll quantity pay number, start row is long formula. And we've also created a form. Let's take a quick look at that form. And this is a form. We've got four different options. 
frequency, start date, period quantity, and then it's going to create a new list or add existing list, add to existing list. And if we right click here and we go into the properties, we can see here in the properties under the source, right, the row source, if we go down here, the row source is pay frequency. Pay frequency, that is the source. Pay frequency is a named range in our application right here. Taking a look here, pay frequency. If we select, we've named this range A10 through A13 pay frequency. So we can use that in our drop down list. So we have pay frequency. So now we need to know what is the control source. B4 means I want that value, I want that number to show up in B4. B4 is here. So whatever the user has selected, it is going to stay here. So whatever the user selected is going to be here bi-weekly. So now we know what the user selected because it's going to be stored here in B4. All right, moving on, we have start date. Now start date here, we go have the control source. It means the cell that is located in B5. Here's B5. That means whatever the user selected is going to be here in B5. Again, B5 is going to be right here, start date. So we've got that. And that's going to be connected there. And the payroll quantity, B6. And whether it's a new list is going to be here or add to list in B7 or B8. So we have those two options here. So we have all of our connected fields from our pop-up right here between B4 and B8. So that's very, very clear. We know. So then we can take VBA and we can base it off those. This way you have a visual representation of all four of these fields. The pay period quantity here, of course, is in admin B6. Now we have our options here, admin B7 for create new list, and we have admin B8. And both of those are from the list option. I've given both of those the list option group name. Both of them have so that they're connected. They both have the same. And one is in values located in B7, one is located in value B8, and then of course the caption text. So it's very, very simple. And of course I've assigned macros to three different items. One, we have the close, which is going to hide this form. We have create pay periods. Let's go ahead and those three options. If they click the close button, we're just going to hide the form. If they click the cancel button, we're just going to also hide the form. However, if they click create, we are going to run this macro, create pay periods. This is the macro that we were just going over. So that is the form. I know it's quick, but um, we've got a lot to get to. So I'm moving a little bit fast. So let's go back into that macro and show you what happens when the user clicks that uh, create button. So we've dimensioned these all as long, the formula rows. We've got start date and next date as dates, and we've got the frequency as string. We're going to focus on sheet four. That's our admin sheet. So with sheet four, we're going to first determine we need to make sure that B4 is not empty or B5 is not empty or B6. Those are all of our connected fields, right? We need to make sure that the user actually has selected values. So B4. B5, B6, those cannot be empty, right? We need to make sure the user has a date, has a quantity, has a frequency. So first we need to make sure that the user has put in values for those. So if any of those are that are empty, we want to create a pop-up box that says please make sure that all fields have been filled out in filled in before creating the pay periods, and then we're going to exit the sub. So that's important. Next up, we can hide the form. We know that they have filled those in properly. We can hide the form. Next, we're going to set our variables. Frequency is going to be B4, start date B5, and payroll quantity B6. Now what I want to do is I want to determine the formula. I need to know what formula should I use. Should I use the weekly formula? Should I use the bi-weekly formula? Should I use the semi-monthly formula? Or should I use the monthly formula? I need to know what formula to use. And those are located in rows 15, 17, 19, and 21. So we can use case. Case is a great feature in Excel. And it's like a very long if-then statement. So we're going to use that based on the frequency. If the case, if frequency is weekly, then we're going to set the formula row, which is a variable of 15 if the case is bi-weekly, we're going to set the formula row to 17, 19, and 21. This allows us to set what formula to use. So now we've got the formula. Also, if B 
B7 value equals true. Well, what is B7? Let's take a look at that. B7 tells us if it's new list. If the user said, yes, I want a new list, then we need to clear it all out. But if the user said, if this is false, if B7 is false, that means we need to find the first available row and start a list from here. For example, when we're creating pay periods, if we create a new list, we buy, we, we create pay periods. Now we create another one, and let's say we want to add five more onto that, but we want to add to existing. Look, B7 is now false. B7 is false. So now when we create pay periods, they get added on right here to the end of the list. Really nice and convenient. So you see how, so we need to find out if B7 is true or false. If B7 is true, then we know we want to clear the entire contents of the list, and the start row is going to be at five. Otherwise, the start row, the row that we're going to start on, is going to be the last row plus one, which is the first available row in column J. All right, now we're ready to start. Now, K and the start row, we're going to put the start date right here. I want to, whatever that start row is, I want to put that start date. So if the start row is here, if we're going to use the existing, the start row is going to be 22, and I want to put that start date right here. Or the start date might be right here if the user has. So the first thing we want to do is take that start date and put it here. Once we have that start date, we can then start adding our formulas here, 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 and here. So we can add those formulas, but that start date is critical in order to add those formulas. So we can do that. We've got to get that start date in that first area. So once we have that, we can then copy the formula based on the formula row. This is the first row. Copy that formula in B. So I want to copy. We have two different formulas. So I want to copy this formula. I want to copy this form. Let's click that out. I want to copy this formula in B, and I want to put it right here. Then I want to copy this formula, and I want to put it right here. And then so on and so forth. So we're going to do that. So let's start out with B. But how far, how much do we copy? Well, we copy down, we paste down, excuse me, paste down the number of the user. If the user wants to create 10 pay periods, then we're going to paste in 10 different rows here. So it's based on the quantity the user has selected. And that payroll quantity is located here in B6. So we've already set that up. Now, moving on, we have in our code here. So we we're gonna first we're gonna copy that, but where are we gonna we're gonna paste it in L, paste it in L, we're gonna paste start at the start row, and we're gonna paste it the pay number, how many the user has selected, and the start row plus the payroll quantity, right? Payroll quantity. We want to know how many have done. So we need to know that. That's very important. So that helps us paste in all the formulas in L, and we want to do the same thing for K, but we're copying A, right? So we just went over that again. Let's go ahead and go. So the first thing is I want to copy B, copy B. I want to basically I want to I'll show you manually. Let's go ahead and look. Let's say the next one is 326. So the user puts in the start date of 326. Okay, so now uh, he says I want to add five payroll periods. So we're gonna, let's say we add five. So we're gonna we're on we're on the biweekly. So biweekly we're gonna copy this and we want to add in five. One, two, three, four, five, five here. Pay special, paste formulas. Okay, great. Now that works. Now of course don't worry about these dates because they're gonna get. Now we need to paste in these. So now we're gonna copy this formula. And we're going to paste it down right here, but not all the way. Not now. We're just going to do four. We've already entered one, so we're going to do the pay quantity is five, but we're going to do four because we want. And then paste the formulas in there. That's how we do it. So that's how VBA paste in those. And the next step, all we're doing really is we're going to do something like in Excel equals this and this underscore quotation underscore quotation end quotation and 22 so basically that's except they're not going to be formatted and then of course we got to format these dates and that's how we do it there so we're going to do that in VBA too so that is how we do it that's how we would do it manually except VBA is going to do that for us with these rows and then the last row J is where our actual pay period name is and that's what I just went over J is going to be where our pay period name is we're going to copy down and do the same thing here so again, J, the start row, plus J in the pay number, plus the start row, plus the payroll quantity, pay special, 
paste the formulas. Now, what is the formula? B14 is the formula. So I've created a formula already. And that formula is right here. So we can take, again, this formula here, which is going to help us see. So when we paste this formula, right click, copy this formula, paste that formula in, it also automatically converts to the paper because we've used it. So here we're formatting it. Now you can change your date formats to whatever your date formats are, but that's really, really a great feature that helps us create pay periods based on almost any frequency or at least four of the common frequencies. So we can create pay periods and those pay periods are gonna be really important when we create those time clock events or we create those payroll, it's gonna really help us out. So that's how we do that. All right, moving on, we've done all of these. Now we've covered employee pay period. And so let's color those, and we have only have a few more to move on in this epic training today. Time clock and payroll history, date autofill. Now that we have those pay periods, we you see how we've created those. And now what I want to do is when we select it, I want to get these dates automatically to appear here. And we can do that, and I want to do the same thing in payroll history right here. I want those dates automatically to appear. So let's go ahead and see how we do that. Back into the developers. And we're, get, we're gonna focus on the employee manager sheet here in the employee date range history. We've created this basically if the user makes a change to F26 or F46, F26 or F46. This is F46, right? this is F26. So if the user makes a change to any of those, what I wanna do is I wanna find this. I wanna, I wanna look in the pay period, I want to find it. I want to determine what row, what whatever row is here, and then I want to put this date and this date inside the from and to. I want to put it here and here. That's what I want to do, but we got to find it. So let's go ahead and see how we did that. We've also dimensioned up here the pay period is range and the found pay period is range. So that's really important. We need to dimension those two ranges those two variables as ranges so this pay period is range and found pay period now the pay period we're going to set that to equal sheet for in the pay period remember this is just the named range for that pay period that is that variable name range we use using offset and count a so we that changes so we can set that now we know the pay period Next up, we're gonna find the pay period. We're gonna use find, right? We're going to search in the pay period. We are going to find, what are we looking for? We're the target value. That means whatever value the user has entered. This is the target value. Whatever the target user has entered, we are going to enter that. That's the target value. So we're looking for that, and we're looking for that target value, and we're looking in this list right here. So if it's found, if not found is nothing. Remember, these cancel each other out. So that means if it's found, that means yes. Then what we're going to do is I want to place those dates in the right. And I want to place those if target offset, excuse me, if not found, pay period is nothing, then do these two things. We can do that with just line target offset. We're going to use the same row as the target, except column is going to be two columns over. Offset means two columns over. Here's our column, one, two. Place something here. Target offset, one, two, three, four. Place something here. So we're gonna use offset to do that. One is two columns over, one is four columns over. And what are we gonna place there? We're gonna place, in this case, sheet four, our admin, K and the found pay period row. Found pay period row, what is the value? So once it's found, we know the row. Once it's found, we're going to place K is going to be the start date, the found row, and L is going to be the end date. So that's how we can then place those values right here, K in the found period from date, and L. So that places those values into the offset. That means the column moving four columns to the right place it. So that's how we can use it for either one of F26 or F46. We can use the same code in both of those. It's relatively simple, but you just have to understand the offset which we're using here. And so that means just entering it is going to automatically change those dates based on that. And if it's not found, nothing will appear, nothing will happen. So it's not a not an issue here. 
right? We're, we have the value. We've got a restricted the value, which is good. That's what we want. And so the user can simply put in there and the dates are changed. And of course, they have the ability to change those dates. And that's basically the same for the payroll history. And the idea is that when we change this, we are then going to run an advanced filter and display all the information here once we have the, those data set up, which we have not yet. So we'll, we're going to get to that shortly, but uh, I wanted to show you that feature today. So we've covered that. Employee add to archive, we've covered that. So great, we've covered that. We're almost getting towards the end. Employee salary option with conditional format, we covered that also. And the event screen design. Lastly, but not least, is the events. And this is a great feature. And I want your feedback on this so that we can continue and complete this out. We're gonna have the ability to add new event and delete event. Now, this group, Add new is only going to show for existing, so you're not going to see four buttons here at the same time. You're going to see two. This will appear when you've selected an existing event. And it's going to be the same principle. When we select an event from the list below, those details are going to appear above. When we have a new event, when we click add new event, we're going to have the ability to save the event or cancel new. So basically, I'm going to place both of these buttons right here, and we're going to only show one at a time one group at a time. And I've just basically added multiple icons here and then grouped them so we can assign macros. No macros have been assigned much here, so it's still in the infancy. So we're gonna have the ability to do that. I've created event type birthday fields. So this is tied to event types in the admin screen. This is tied to the employees. And this is a created on date. We're ability to add notes. I'm gonna add tab orders to this. And we wanna know if it's recurring. How many days, weeks? We're gonna add, it could be recurring every three weeks, recurring every two months, recurring every two years. So we're gonna set the recurring so that once we set it and forget it, if we want a recurring. Now, if we don't, we can unselect this. Now, how did we create this cool feature? I've saved the best for the last because this is not a form icon. This is a basically simply if uh, icon you can see right here, this is just an I, this is just a character and recurring, but we set the font. Now, how do we do that using the same exact cell? Let's go ahead and go into the VBA. Firstly, we've created some conditional formatting. Let's go ahead and highlight this, go into conditional formatting, and manage the rules and take a look at the conditional formatting. We've said in this rule, if D11 equals this O, basically it's like an O, but it's an icon, and recurring, then I want to format this. I want to hide it. I want to create, I want to fill everything with that background blue. I want to remove all the borders using clear, and I want to set the font to this blue color so that everything gets hidden. However, if it's something other than that, if it's checked, then I want everything to show up. Now, let's go ahead and go into the VBA to show how we get that automatically on selection. Into the Developers tab, Visual Basic, we're going to go into the Events, and we've used just a little bit of macros. Here, if the user selects D11, if user makes a selection to D11, we're going to focus on the active cell. So if the active cell equals this B, which is that check mark icon and reoccurring, then we're going to set the value equal that. Otherwise, set it to this B. And this is the checkbox. This is the actual checkbox, but it's the font that changes. So what we want to do is I then want to change it. If I don't change the font, it's going to look funny. Let's go ahead and comment out these just so we can see what it looks like without the font change. If we don't change the font and uh, go back in there and click on reoccurring, it's going to kind of look like all the same font, and we really don't want that. So we've got to change those fonts because I want multiple fonts. I want the checkbox to have a Wingdings font, and I want the reminders to have the Calibri font. So same cell, two different fonts. So we can do that in VBA by splitting it up. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, starting at character one, for just the length of one, one character length, we're going to set the first character to the Wingdings font. The remaining, starting right after that, starting at character two and the length of 16, we're going to set it to the Calibri font, the Calibri font. That way we can, and we're going to select F11, just select out of the existing cell by selecting F11. So that way when we select it, it 
automatically has two different fonts in the same cell, giving us that really cool checkbox feature without using either one of the form controls or the ActiveX control, just using font. So it's a very, very cool and different way to set a checkbox. And the reason is, one, I didn't want to use another cell for a checkbox. I didn't want to use this cell. I wanted to use just one cell. And I didn't really want to use an ActiveX, and I didn't want to use a form control. So I wanted to use something different. So we have that ability here. And using conditional formatting, we can do that. I've done the same thing for reminders, the same exact code, except the characters are slightly different. In this case, we've got only 15 characters. So we've set that at there, and basically that is. So that is all we have to do. And in fact, I've got two, I've got some icons that I also wanted hidden. I've got these show pop-up icons and this email icon. I also want those to be hidden if the user has not selected those. And what I've done is I've grouped those two in one group, shapes group called event email reminders. And based on the selection here, we're going to hide or show those. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. That's just one more line of code. If the value equals B and then reminders, it's like a B, but it's a check box. If it's a check box, then show, show that group. Otherwise, if it's unchecked, and remember B is like the check mark there. It's not really a B. I don't know what it is. Then they show this little O. Oh, otherwise, hide those. Otherwise, hide. Hide that group shape. Okay? This is hide. So that's all we have to do to show and hide it. And then we're going to select I13 after that. We might change the selection on that. I might change it in the future because I don't really want I don't really want uh, this selected. Maybe we'll select this or something. In other words, if reminders are off, I don't really want to select B5 if, if they have select unselected it. So we'll probably change that in the future. We'll have the ability to, none of the none of macros have been assigned yet on this, but that gives us the ability of what we're going to look for. And also I want to create an email. So if they say yes, I want to create an email. I want to unhide rows 14 through 21. I want to unhide those if this is yes. And we do that through VBA right here into the worksheet change. They're actually making a change. If L13, that's the yes or no cell we were just on, if the target value equals yes, then simply rows 14 through 21, unhide, unhide, hidden equals false, otherwise hide them. 14 through 21, true. So that's going to uh, hide them. All right, so that's how we covered the, at least the design part of the employee events. We're going to build this out, but I want to get all your suggestions. If there's something missing, now is the time to add that in before I've actually programmed and done all of our mapping. We're going to add our mapping into, I've uh, allowed row 25 to do our mapping. Unhide that. There's no mapping in here yet, but we're going to use that as mapping. So we've got that already set up to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. We've covered everything that we had. We got our, it's an epic training, a very long training. I appreciate you sticking with me. We've got covered a lot. This is going to be an amazing application. I appreciate your patience, of course, and sharing this. Share it so that we can keep this and we can finish out this application by adding time clock, adding payroll, and a few other amazing features. Please share it. Please comment. Please like it. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. Thank <music> you.